boom, this is Mind Pump. We're the world's number one fitness, health, entertainment podcast. All right, would you like to win a free MAPS Prime program? Of course you would. Here's how you can win free access. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. If we pick your comment, you'll get access to MAPS Prime for free. Now, for the rest of you, you can get MAPS Prime at 50% off flash sale going on right now. Go to mapsprime.com. Use the code PRIME. Five zero off. That's prime 50 off. Now, if you'd like to win stuff, uh, we give stuff away all the time. So turn on your notifications, subscribe to this channel so you know when we post these episodes. All right. Enjoy the podcast. We've been doing this for a long time. And every so often you get your, you just, everything you think gets flipped on its head. Yeah. But there's one thing in particular that I can think about. And I wonder if you guys are the same that just, just the, such a crazy, complete reversal and flip. Um, actually, let me see if you guys are the same. What, what's one of the biggest changes you've made in how you look at training over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years? Oh my God, bro. That's know, such a, that's, that's so vague. So like, many can things. you give me, can you, can you take me closer to where you want to go? Yeah. Where like you did, so you thought of a value of something, you did a particular thing and then you learned something else. You're like, oh, uh, well, I'll tell you one of the most. Okay. So I got one for you and it's recent, right? Okay. Or, or relatively recent since the, the same, podcast. I want to see if it's the same one that, I uh, uh, foam rolling before I work out. Yeah. That was something that I, I, I didn't do. I did thought, whoa, what a huge difference this was 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 doing, and became like a ritual. Like that's how I started every mm-hmm. workout. I spent a good ten to fifteen minutes uh, foam rolling before. And then you're applying it to every one of your clients after. Yeah, that totally. Too, right? yeah, yeah, no, I'm hundred percent guilty of that. At, even up to when we started the show, when we first started the show, I was still foam rolling. It wasn't until uh, I met Brink, till uh, Justin Brink, Doctor Brink, um, did I, he move me away from that. And move me into the direction of more like mobility and priming stuff. That yeah. was the biggest switch. Yeah, for me. that's specific. But generally speaking, for me, it was warm ups. Uh, my yeah, yeah, same idea right. around warm ups completely shifted uh, later on in my career. Right. So when I was a train for a long time, you know, I would get peak clients and I'd have them warm up on a little cardio. Right. Get the heart rate up and you know warm the body up. Maybe some light type of stretching, foam rolling. Now, is it true? Another one. Truth be told, it was a little bit of that. So you had an extra ten minutes to go eat your food in the that, back. That like, that guarantee that's part of that it. That was the added value. I, I, I really, I'm like, I got enough time to get a Starbucks coffee. You I, know, yeah, just keep uh, you know moving. I yeah. really think a lot of us uh, trainers, you're calling everybody out. Just, I am. True. I am. I think we all kind of justify that because when you run. When you're going clients, yeah. Back when you to run back, an eight, ten hour day, and you're and you're and you're you know hitting them all by the, on the hour. Yeah, you're you're on all day. Yeah, there's no break. Nothing. There's no break. So you literally have, a, and and sometimes you secretly are praying for a client to be late, so you have the opportunity to, to shovel some food down, yes. right, or go get a, a coffee really quick. So the ten minute warm up yeah. on the elliptical or Dude, whatever. I had some clients. <laughs> I had some clients mess that up because I would have everybody warm up on cardio. First of all, we were taught that we were taught get the heart rate up, That's warm right, up we the body. Reduces risk of injury, blah blah blah. And we're going to get into yeah, we why sold that. Hard. We're going to get into why that's almost completely crap, uh, bullshit. But uh, we bought into it, and then of course, like you said, Adam, it was great because it bought you ten minutes. But then I would have clients that would ruin the whole thing, where their appointment was let's say at five p.m. <laughs> they came in early. They come in early to do their warm up, so they're ready by you know the time that it's time to trade. I was like, ah, you know who always did I don't that? Got time to you eat. want to know? It's funny. You know what clients always did that? It was not my clients that were highly motivated. It was the ones that were like the penny pinchers and they were like okay every I'm, dollar i'm paying this guy 80 dollars an hour I, yeah. that means i get 60 minutes if he's if i spend 10 minutes on this elliptical this is oh, silly I'm i want to squeeze everything they, out of this yes those are the clients that that were smart and would come in early it was not the ones like oh i want to put the extra work in yes. or i need to do this it was like i'm paying this yeah. dude for i'm gonna i'm gonna come in here before this yeah now this. now here's where my mind started to get blown it was understanding what warm-ups really do so what we're taught is they warm up the muscles right so yeah. warm t- more elasticity yeah. in the tissue that kind of stuff. yeah warm tissues are more Blood elastic flow. and pliable and i even they even gave me this example they said imagine you have a rubber band and you put it in the freezer right you can't stretch it out very much it snaps yeah. but if you put it in the if you warm it up it's much more so i literally thought of muscles like that I like they're like told people that did you really yeah, yeah. that they're like rubber bands this is actually not true. The reality is what makes the muscle pliable or not or whatever is your central nervous system. Yeah. The reality is a warm-up is not warming up the muscles. It's getting the CNS 
uh, to to start to fire and function in a way that is beneficial. When you understand that, mm -hmm. then you look at your warm ups completely different. No one really communicated the CNS very well to me. It was all it was in every certification, in every book we had to read, but it was always a daunting chapter that I never enjoyed, and I never I never really learned how to apply it to clients till much later. Yes, yeah. yeah. I feel like yeah, th this is definitely an area where I adjusted my training completely, as well as like addressing f like the feet and ankles too. That was one of those things that like none of our certifications did a good job of, of addressing you know, no, in terms no. of mobility. Yeah, if you took like if I took my bicep off my body, if I peeled it off and threw it on the floor. Um, it's a, it's just it's dumb by itself. It, it, it'll have a certain amount of you know stretch to it. It's not it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. If I have a tight hamstring and I tear it out, it's not tight anymore because I tore it off my body. Now it's on the floor. It seems pretty flexible. In fact, if you talk to so I used to train a lot of surgeons and doctors, and when people are an, under anesthesia, they would always comment how remarkably flexible they were, right? Because the CNS is is dampened and shut down, right. right? So what makes a muscle do anything, whether it's be tight? or contract or relax or stretch is the central nervous system. So to give you an example, if let's say you you go to, to stretch your hamstring, so you go do a, a toe, you go to touch your toes, and the furthest you can get initially is where your fingertips barely touch your foot. Now if you stretch and you hold that stretch for 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, you will find that eventually within within a minute, you'll be able to go down further past where you could go before. And now you've added you know, three, four, five, or six inches of range of motion. Now, what didn't happen was your hamstrings change. In other words, the hamstrings themselves- Yeah, they didn't get longer or more elastic also. No, they didn't change at all. The difference was the central nervous system- Relaxed. Told the hamstrings, uh, okay, we're okay here, we're yeah. safe, stretch, stretch, stretch. So really, warm-ups are all about the CNS and have very little to do with- you know, muscle and well, and, and a lot of our body. limitations are, you know, a factor of what we, we call like the overbearing mother. Like it's so it's it's basically like it it's limiting you for a reason because it, it feels like there's instability there. There's lo low support. And so, you know, that that being able to to channel the central nervous system to support those joints and provide that kind of stability allows you then to go even further, uh, you know, angle wise. Right. And so the promise of warm ups in the past was to reduce the risk of injury. So if you warm up properly, you're less likely to pull a muscle or tear a muscle or hurt your joint or whatever. That was the promise. Um, now, did they actually deliver? Maybe. Depends on how you did the warm up, but they delivered very little. They didn't do much at all um, in terms of you know promising that delivery. In fact, uh, there were studies that showed that the traditional ways, and I remember learning this, the tradi traditional ways people warmed up for a long time, like static stretching, actually increase the risk of injury. Now you might ask yourself, how's that? Why, why is that? Why is it that static stretching before workouts or warming up wrong is worse than not warming well, you up just, at all? It's you, passive. Well, you just alluded to it, right? You said that what happens after you, you do a static stretch for 30 seconds, you tell this, the CNS tells the muscle to relax, mm -hmm. to relax. It's not protecting as much. That's right. It's not, it's, it's, it's relaxed. And then you want to, then you go into a workout and potentially something like a CrossFit or explosive type mm -hmm. of a workout where you need to call upon that muscle and you want it to respond fast there you, and you just got done sending a signal to say, relax, calm down. That's they're they're conflicting signals, right? And or, that's where the danger or the risk is. Or at. you move in a range of motion you don't own, right? And then you hurt yourself. So where does the injury come from? Okay, injury does comes from weakness, and it, injuries come from weakness. Now, uh, some people might be thinking, well, I know super strong power lifters and bodybuilders that hurt themselves. Yes, that's true. But they were weak at one particular point, whether it be stability or in a range of motion. There's they didn't a kink own. in the chain somewhere. And, right. And that's where the injury happened. So what a warm-up should do is improve your strength and your function. That's what reduces the risk of injury. Not necessarily increasing range of motion or just making your body feel warm, but rather getting the central nervous system to fire more efficiently, more effectively, and to be stronger because you don't hurt yourself in a movement that you own. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. If you own the squat, if you own the deadlift, if you own a fast twist or throwing a baseball, if you own the movement from beginning to end, acceleration to deceleration, stability, the whole thing, if you own it, you're not going to get hurt. Right. It's when you don't own the movement that you injure yourself. So what a warm-up should do is get you closer to owning more of the movement yeah. 
it to, in order to prevent injury. If you can't generate any force in whatever position you're in, you know, you're going to leave yourself susceptible to some kind of an injury. And so to be able to, uh, you know, work on that and be able to, to address those weak, weak points in, in, in the chain is going to be crucial for you to have long-term success. And this is really the only thing that makes heavy load dangerous mm -hmm. is not owning the movement. Of course. It, it, this idea of like, oh, heavy weight, heavy squatting is bad for the knees or it's this exercise is dangerous. It's it's only dangerous. Or it's only bad for the knees if you don't own that movement. You don't own that range of motion. Right. If you haven't done the prerequisites to be able to do that, then when you load something, you're more likely to move out of that range and injure yourself. But if you do a good job of actually priming the body and owning that movement, then you're less likely to get hurt. Look, I could squat 200 pounds very easily. It will not hurt myself squatting 200 pounds. If I put 200 pounds on my 11-year-old daughter's back, she's going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. Same weight, right? The difference is I can own that weight and that movement, and she can't. So really, this is what it all boils down to. And when you realize this, and you realize that the paradigm around warm-ups should be getting the central nervous system ready, mm -hmm. uh, also known as priming the central nervous system, then you're going to have much less risk of injury, number one. Number two, you'll also have a far more effective and efficient workout, a workout that actually gets you better results. Do, you, do either of you know the the history on like warm-ups, like the whole callus thing? You remember like when we were, in, when we were kids, yeah. do you remember like PE class, like do you, getting in the line, the rows, and like the the, the yeah. windmill things that you would do? Like, do you do you guys know the history? I have no idea. Like, I don't know what the history is. I know like it's where, where where did we land on that, and where did this become the kind of traditional well, way everybody warms yeah, up? Yeah, no, there's there was a few like pioneers in calisthenics, and and Doctor Ed Thomas was one of them. But like, uh, it was all like with a lot of intent behind it, which kind of got lost in the weeds. I think that it just got distorted uh, once it made its way into schools, and you know they they saw and tried to mimic certain movements and like arm circles and things, but there was no real intention behind it. Yeah. It was just aimless. That's such a good good point because this was something that I always had a hard time communicating to clients and because it, it almost comes off like we're anti-stretching. Mm. Right, like we no, there's you, value to it. You no, it's it very right similar. To, I feel like when we communicate cardio, right? People right. think we're anti cardio because, but really, what it is is, and I tell my clients is, we have to learn to stretch with purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a lot of value in in stretching and static stretching, but knowing what you're stretching and why you're stretching it is extremely important, and when to do that. Right, and because, there there's certain places to do a static stretch, and there's certain places it doesn't belong. Right, because if you have instability within your normal range of motion, let's say you have a little little bit of instability and in, within your, your your squat or whatever and then we just give you more range of motion we just say here you go more which which static stressing will do in a, in a short period of time give you more range of motion but not increasing any strength or stability we've actually made a, a situation worse is what ends up happening so static stretching definitely has a place it's it's to increase range of motion but you need to connect to that range of motion and so the way we've warmed up in the past was almost a waste of time now the traditional warm-ups of getting on cardio, for example, it's it's a little better than nothing because will that turn on your central nervous system more than just coming, you know, driving to the gym and then walking and then starting to work out? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to get more of a central nervous system turn on from doing, you know, walking on the treadmill or going the elliptical than you are from just going straight to the workout. A little bit more. But not a whole lot more, you know. Well, there's definitely value in prepping the body for you know intense movement and intense loading of the joints, and so, but but there has to be that intent behind it. And so, to to be more specific to your own needs is something that uh, you know is hasn't been really voiced in the past. And I think that uh, people need to really uh, figure out. Like, obviously, we tried to make this a lot easier in terms of like just doing three movements to identify these things, but to really understand their body more and their needs in terms of where their imbalances lie, uh, you know, what, what type of exercises will help kind of set them up better for, uh, especially with the compound list, better performance in the gym. Right. Now back to foam rolling, like what, what, then what does foam rolling do? Well, foam rolling can allow you to move in ways that may be beneficial. And that's where the benefit comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. So tread lightly here. Right. So if I do a foam roller and that didn't fix anything, but what it might do is allow me to then do priming movements or exercises in ways that are more beneficial to my body, or at least get to them a little faster. So foam rolling still has some value. But when I first started foam rolling, I thought that was the value. That was it. Like, Oh, foam roll. Now I can do all these exercises. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up finding was 
I got to the point where I had to foam roll. I could no longer do movements without foam rolling because I never followed it up with movements that made it. Yeah, it kept reoccurring the same pain. Yeah, you want to make the foam rolling obsolete, essentially. If you use a foam roller, you want to get to the point where you don't need a foam roller anymore. That won't happen unless you do the proper priming uh, and, and real warm-up movements, which I think well, we'll get into. The challenge with foam rolling was that I think we, we misunderstood exactly what it was doing for so long. And it was one of those things that you could feel the difference. Oh yeah, you feel it right away. And so it's it was it was really hard to kind of overcome this one also because I think I, I explained foam rolling wrong for a very long time. Oh yeah, uh, I was under the impression that we had these adhesions like scar tissue that was built up over you're the muscle, and you're like kneading it like bread. Yeah, yeah like and that you were yeah exactly, out. and that's what we had all these adhesions. This was limiting the range of motion in the muscle, and you're going in with these foam rolls. You're basically breaking those all up, and then that's then allowing you to do that and when you would take somebody what do they feel they feel like these knots yeah and then they would do it and they would feel looser and better yes. so it was like it this is what it's doing yes and by the way those knots in your muscle are there but they're not there because you have like a, a like a tissue that's stuck or whatever they're there because again the cns is making it be there and right. pressing on it just tells the cns to relax that's a focal point it's it just is like hitting and, it over yeah and over your and cns over. is telling the muscle to kind of be in this light state of tonus and so when you press on it you're sending a signal back to the cns and then the cns says oh okay we don't need to be in this state of tonus or what kind of tricks it and cause it to relax but the tissue itself and is you're not breaking up a, and an is what causes that is that just a, a a neurological like over over application to that area like your your body is firing more neurons than needed to that area and that that's well, what causes the over firing tonus. what it thinks it's needed right yeah. Yeah. so because it's trying to protect it's a protective mechanism yeah. yes so all this is because your body uh is trying to keep you from hurting yourself so it's going to make you tight and feel pain in a certain way limiting your range of motion so you don't do things that you don't necessarily have the stability uh, to perform. And so this is where uh, the problem comes in. So you got to solve the root issue. Now, what warm-ups can do for you if you do them properly um, is definitely reduce the risk of injury in a very, very big way. But it does way more than that. And this is where I think where I want people to really evaluate what they're doing before the workout, the 10 minutes or 15 minutes before the workout. A proper warm-up increases your functional range of motion. This is very different. I don't care if you if your body allows you to squat all the way down, if you've got no stability all the way down, don't do that, right? If you can't if you go all the way ass to grass but you've got no stability, please don't do that because all you're going to do is potentially hurt yourself or probably hurt yourself especially when you add load. What I want is functional range of motion. So you're able to go deeper, but you still own usable. Yes, that deeper range of motion. Do you guys remember like the type of client that you got when you first saw this? Like when you saw somebody who had like incredible range of motion. Oh yeah. And and flexibility, but then they they when they got down in the squat, the knees went all over the oh, place yeah. and they were all wobbly like Dude, crazy. I can remember one woman in particular. Those were difficult to train. She would come in. That was hard. And she would talk about a lot of pain. And so I was text testing her flexibility because back in those days, I thought, oh, it's because you're tight, right? Yeah. And she was hyper flexible, like fold her in half, sit at the way all the way at the bottom, arms, she could touch her elbows behind her back. like. And I remember thinking like, what the hell is going on? Luckily, I worked with a really, really good physical therapist and she's like, well, she's uh, hyper ranges of motion and no strength. She's like a baby. Like yeah. you take a baby who can move all over the place. Super moldable, but yeah, they don't have the strength to get out of these positions. Nothing supporting it. And and that's actually one of the, that's a very high risk of injury under load. Yeah. Right. So with that person, I had to really focus on getting them to own ranges of motion before we'd move into deeper ranges of motion and make her strong and her pain went away. As well. It was all about increasing strength. Her pain. Yeah, yeah it was all away. about control. Those were difficult for me to, to, to deal with because yeah, you for the majority of people, you're trying to, to open up ranges of motion. You're trying to, to unlock because we get so locked into these certain positions because of our daily habits and, and rituals and whatnot. But, uh, you know, somebody like that, to, to be able to slow down and really have and gain control and really like add tension and, and strength. So I would, I would apply a lot more like isometrics. I'd have them stop and really yeah. hold and squeeze. And, you know, there's ways to, to, to address that. But you really need to, to work on uh, the ability to, to, 
to, to ramp up and, and summon like this, this force that you need to, uh, you know, feed into, to strengthen the movement. This was when I was really unaware of the benefits of isometrics. When I first had a, a client like this, like this, that was foreign to me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I struggled a lot. I remember having a, a handful of clients early it's on. It's because it's not common. It's not. You it's don't see it's that really often. rare to see it. And you're so used to people being tight all the time. Yeah, tight and weak is more common yes. than loose and weak. Yeah. And to see somebody who could, could actually perform the full range of motion, the exercise, but just is all over the map. You're kind of like, where do I start here with this person? And I didn't understand what was happening in isometrics. I just thought, I actually thought that was an old methodology of training and that was dead and we've moved mm -hmm. on from that at that point in my career and didn't really understand what you were doing on a neurological level when you're doing isometrics and that's what that person was lacking and what they needed so right bad. and so and here's another thing a proper warm-up is going to increase the amount of muscle fibers that you activate here's mm -hmm. here's one telltale sign between a classic crappy warm-up and a proper warm-up a classic crappy warm-up might make the exercise you do next feel more comfortable, okay? It might do that. Oh, I can get in and I feel okay. I don't have pain in my shoulder. That's great. A proper warm-up, oftentimes you'll feel stronger yeah. going into the lift. In fact, when I've worked with clients and transitioned them from the old way to the, the superior way, all of a sudden they were hitting PRs. Yeah. They were just, their squat went up in weight and their bench went up in weight and their overhead press went up in weight because we turned on the central nervous system uh, in a very effective way. Does this turn into faster results? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you know, uh, this is just my figure, but I think if you do a proper warm up and priming, you probably can squeeze out, you know, 5% more out of your results and your progress. And it doesn't sound like much, but over the course of six months and a year, that makes it pretty damn, that's, the, that's like a pounds of muscle that you could be adding to your body or faster metabolism or burning more body fat or, you know, 10 more pounds on your on your lifts. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple approaches to this that uh, you can apply for priming, but uh, one of my favorites is to address whatever uh, whatever is 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 pulling you out of stability. So this is why I like to go through the, the whole process of really finding out where those imbalances lie. So for example, you know, let's say your, your shoulders tend to, to come forward quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to, to bench press and to, to be able to set your, your body up right and to be able to have security and support and stability there in the shoulder joint and really be able to retract and depress those shoulders. I'd have, you know, I'd prime with some kind of a, a you know, a rubber band row or something to, to, to get my muscles to respond, to stabilize and support then going into like one of those compound lifts. Now, this is, this is why um, I'm most proud of our MAPS Prime program. Of all the things that we've created and done, um, I'm most proud of that program. Still to this day, all the things that, we, I, because... I think this is really difficult to do. I don't, I mean, it took me years as a trainer to kind of piece all this together. Yeah. And then once you kind of start to grasp it, right? So if you're listening mm -hmm. right now and you've maybe heard us talk about this, you're like, okay, kind of making sense to me now, mm -hmm. but still don't fully understand what they're talking about, the difference between warming up and priming, or maybe you're moving into like, okay, yeah, I get it. The next hurdle is how do you figure out that specifically to you? Because what is going to prime really well for somebody else could actually be counterproductive for another person based off of where they're weak or where they have postural issues. Like So knowing what to prime for either what exercises or for your body specifically was probably one of the challenging, most challenging things that we had to overcome in creating a program. And I, I think that is, and it's one of those things that if you don't know, you don't know. And if you never used it or applied it, it just, it's. You, you do it once though, the right way in your soul. Yeah. If you do it correctly yeah. one time, it's one of those things that you immediately feel it in that workout. You don't have to do, it's not like strength building muscle or strength. You don't have to do it for long no. periods of time of consistency before you start to see little, it's like, you should be able to do this. And that's how you should know if you're actually doing it right. Yeah. If you're doing it right. It sh you should feel that in that very next workout or in that workout. Yeah, I, I've used this example before, but I love the story because uh, I remember getting like confused by this demonstration uh, in the mall and then later figuring out what they were doing and being like, oh, now I know. So mm -hmm. years ago, um, there was these these products. You'd see them in kiosks in the mall and they were like these bracelets or these the, necklaces. The magnets. Yeah, and yeah. it was like, you know, oh, MLB players wear these for better performance and it balances out your body and blah, blah, blah. 
And the kids selling it would be like, oh, yeah, it totally works. And I'd be like, this is, what is it? And he's like, oh, it's this new composite material or whatever. It's advanced, blah, blah, blah. He'd say, okay, let me let me show you how it works. He'd say, stand on one foot and put your right arm out. So I'd stand on my left foot or whatever, put my right arm out, and he'd push down on my arm, and then I'd kind of fall over. And he'd say, now try it with the bracelet. So immediately after, he put the bracelet on me. He'd do it again. And my balance was significantly better the second time around. I remember almost buying it, but I was was like like magic. I was like, wait a minute, I'm not going to get this. Anyway, later on, I figured out, oh, all I did the first time was tell my CNS what to do. Second time around, I was able to have better stability and control because I practiced it once. That's literally what happened. My CNS fired better the second time around. This guy's using this, you know, what happens to all of us as a way to sell me some, you know, some bullshit uh, product. So this is what proper... Warm ups can do for you. This is why, so in, in the book, The Resistance Training Revolution, although I wrote that as a way to really convince people, the average person especially, to do resistance training as their primary form of exercise, if you go in the workouts that I put in the book, there, although I say warm up, and the reason why I say warm up is because I would have to explain priming you know, to, to people who maybe have never even done resistance training. It says warm up, but what you do in there is yeah. priming. What you do with every workout is two or three priming movements before you get the workout and i know people are gonna be blown away when they when they do them well, because of, i've seen it a very simple thing that i've i've tried so hard to convey to athletes and anybody that uh really wants to squeeze out performance uh, the more stable and secure your joints are the more force you can output and yes. so what that means is you're able to apply more strength to all those movements yes it's, it's very simple here if you don't if, you, if you're listening to justin right Which now also means more it, muscle yes <laughs> and you're and you're like okay yes. wh- what do you mean by that right so uh in, in in layman's terms your body will only allow you to exert as much force as it thinks you can safely exert okay here's an example of that go do a barbell squat as heavy as you can then put on a weight belt all of a sudden you're squatting more weight, right? All the weight belt did is increase your core stability. You sense it, you're more stable, more force coming out of your legs, right? If your bench press is stuck at, you know, 135 pounds and your body says, and it knows, eh, a little instability in that left shoulder, it's not going to let you get that much stronger. If you increase the stability of your shoulder, even if you don't do a special bench routine or you know, all, all you do is increase the stability of the area that your body is sensing as the weakness, Boom, all of a sudden, your bench press goes up. Increasing stability allows your body to exert more force. And I know, you know, studies will show that, you know, most people can't even get up to 50% of their total capacity. The body yeah. literally limits them uh, from doing that. Now, what do you guys have to say to the people in the, and there's some very intelligent people in the strength community that believe that all you need to do is just, just to practice the movement. And that is going to, prime the CNS and and get the body to get more force output like Justin is, is alluding to and build more stability and control. What do you have to say to that? Because there is there is some really smart guys and girls in the strength community mm-hmm. that think this whole mobility movement and, and priming and doing things like that is a waste of time. All you need to do is get under the barbell and squat more. Well, here's the, the reality is you will get better at those movements the more you practice them and so where they're coming from you know in terms of that makes sense uh practicing and applying those same movements continuously you're teaching your body to improve every time with uh, the mechanics of it the technique of it uh but you know the the more the inevitably uh you're you're gonna get to a point where you're gonna get so strong just in that direction where it's gonna create instability And, and now that instability is something that you're gonna have to uh account for later which you could have simultaneously yeah. been working on with mobility to uh, make sure that those joints still feel like they're in, in locked in that place and, and have that security yeah I remember it. earlier in the episode I said injury comes from weakness so let's say your stability let's say I don't know, I'm gonna make up some numbers let's say your stability strength score needs to be at least of a ratio of one to two to your your total strength so in other words if your squat is 300 pounds your stability needs to be at 150 pounds well, if I don't increase my stability strength and my squat strength goes up to 400, the ratio is off. My risk of injury goes up much higher. So now getting stronger increases my risk of injury because my stability strength right. no longer can support it. Now, I know where these strength athletes and coaches are coming from. Yes, it's true. Practicing the movement does have a lot of value. In fact, I think after you prime, you should still do a set or two of lighter weight with your target exercise. That being said... 
the priming movements and mobility movements have a ton of value. In fact, a lot of these same guys and girls end up with injuries, end up on their Instagram doing these mobility movements that their therapist right. yeah. then told them to do. It, I've seen them. It's mind-blowing. Oh, I, all of yeah. a sudden I see, you know, so-and-so exactly. lifter who, 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 you know, crapped on all of that stuff, all of a sudden doing tube walks yeah. in 90-90s because they've hurt their well, back it's either that like. or they invent products to create stability and support, you know, with uh, certain, like, elastic, you know, shoulder things and, and right. you know, knee sleeves and everything else, you know, in order to kind of provide what they're lacking. Well, this is where uh, – there's also what is one of the problems, I think, in our in our space, right, and also with what's wrong with, with studies, right, because mm. – you know, m most of these intelligent people that I'm talking about, they don't just say that. They they point and they reference studies to support yeah. their argument. And my my thing is this: I I think if all your goal was to squat more weight or bench more weight, their their argument has a lot of validity to it. Right. You know, if that's all you care. But most people not only want that, but they also want to be able to move yeah. <laughs> left to right really well. And keep going. Rotate, get all the way, sit down to pick up their child, uh, want to be able to feel good when they're 70 years old, and also get a really strong bench and mm -hmm. a really good squat. Sure. And I just think that that's the, the way that I would respond to somebody who's challenging me with that statement is because, yeah, okay, you're right. If we looked at this in this this very narrow box of like okay all i want to do is get good at squatting and that's right if i just practice squat pass practice squat practice squat forget all that other bullshit if you were to do two more sets of squats you'd be even better at the heavy getting still challenge squat. that though you know I, I i honestly i still think that them doing that but also addressing a lot of uh, the other abilities of articulating the joint and, and expressing that will provide more stability which then helps them to generate more force yeah. uh, again these are, the, don't, these are the same people that said Training your biceps if you're a power lifter is a waste of time. Ah, why train your biceps? You're 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 not you don't need your biceps. Well, now a lot of them have changed uh, their tune because they find that strengthening strengthening your biceps reduces your risk of a bicep tear, and because of the increased stability at the elbow, might actually help you deadlift uh, more weight. Right. Um. So I don't think it should. If you're a strength athlete, I don't think it should, you know, take over your training. Any kind of athlete, by the way, this is true for all athletes. I don't care if it's a strength athlete or you play football or baseball or whatever. Most of your training should be done in your sport, right? So if you're a strength athlete, yes, definitely devote most of your time to, to training in your spe specific you know, strength sport, whatever that may be. But priming properly is going to provide you with a lot of value. At the very least, reducing risk of injury. At the most, like what Justin's saying, you'll probably see some – some increased or faster strength gains uh, yeah. from doing so. And it doesn't take a lot of time. We're talking about 10 minutes, 15 minutes before your workout. What you don't want to do is this, because here's what happens. When you feel pain, you're too late. And when you know, when you don't feel pain, it doesn't mean you're in the clear. There's this gap between not enough stability, no pain, no pain, no pain, and then pain. So sometimes what people do is they like, oh, my SI joint hurts. Oh, my knee hurts a little bit. They do a little bit of priming mobility. Pain gone. I'm good. No, 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 no. You're just this close to pain. You're you just move this far. We can go a lot further. The, the other thing I don't like with their their argument too is that in my experience, like, so if you're taught if you're an athlete, you're talking specific to athletes, and and you're talking to everybody who's already a pretty good squatter, a pretty good deadlifter, then I, I I see this applying a little more towards them. But when I think of the general population, it was very rare. In fact. I could probably count on one hand, maybe two hands in my entire career when I asked someone to do a squat in front of me and it was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just flawless. Was never. Never, right? No. It was like rarely ever did you ever see that. And most often you saw a really poor recruitment pattern. You saw this excessive forward lean, these rounded shoulders, this protruding forward They didn't head. even know how to activate certain areas. Right. And so if you tell that person just to squat more, and that's why I don't like when, when they come out and they make statements like this or they're anti-mobility, is because you just te teach that you, they just – ingrain that bad recruitment pattern. They may get good at squatting. Yeah. And they may good say at bad squatting. Right. And and that right there is what is is a, a dangerous place to go. And it also it started to, you know, I feel like there's a, a lot of people that want to justify their their 
awkward, weird squat or deadlift stance and movement pattern and be like, oh, it's my morphology. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, that's because my hip socket doesn't allow me to do that. And it's like, no, it's not. There's many people that told me that they thought that they're, you know, they were told by somebody else that their morphology wouldn't allow them to do this narrow, this narrow stance squat because they can tell it just, it doesn't feel comfortable. And then I worked on their mobility, primed them correctly and oh, voila, we can do it all yeah. of a sudden. And to me, that's a, that's very obvious that it isn't just simply they need to practice the movement more. They've got to get themselves in a more ideal position so they can do the movement. Yeah, the more force distribution. Right. You know, how are you going to get around that if you're not in good posture? It's going to stop where there's curvature. It's going to stop where there's a weakness in the kinetic chain. You can't get around that no matter how uh, hard you, you try and work around it. Yeah, and the morphology argument, it reminds me of the whole uh, genetic argument for, for, for weight gain and right, weight right, loss. for like, obesity. Oh, yes, like, right, right. oh, you know, I know I'm 60 pounds overweight, but it's my genetics, you know. And no, yes, there's different – genetics definitely exist. There's definitely differences between And they play people. a role. They do play a role. But there aren't genetics that exist to make you obese uh, that, d that didn't exist until not that long ago, right? Uh, there are, yes, there's definitely differences in morphology, but a squat, uh, a, an overhead press. That's a fundamental throwing, That's a fundamental movement. It's like walking. Right. Yes, there's morphologies, you know, different leg lengths and different soccer for, for walking. But are there morphologies that exist where you can't walk? Uh, extremely rare, right? Yeah. It's extremely rare. So, and, and here's the deal. Regardless, if there is a, a situation with your morphology that makes certain movements uh, more challenging, working on mobility and proper priming will make you it, it make it more likely to reach your potential, mm -hmm. right? You may have a lower potential. Like I don't have the muscle building potential of Ronnie Coleman, but I have my own potential and I can get closer to my potential by doing everything right. I might not reach his, I might not ever get the mobility of a, of a world-class gymnast, but I'll reach my upper limit of mobility by doing things right. right. And proper priming is a part of that. So, and here's the thing I want to communicate. I think it's very important. And I know this, this is a, this is a selling point because I know as a young lifter, if you told me you know, proper priming and warming up will reduce your risk risk of injury. Uh, one ear out the other. That's why I didn't do it. Yeah, I'm in my, I mean, all I cared about was building more muscle. Yeah, I'm in my 20s. I could care less. Yep. I'm not. I haven't. I've never hurt myself. I feel indestructible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why it waste? Needs a new sales pitch. Yeah, but here here's the other part of it, and this is true. Proper priming gets you better results. You'll build more muscle. You'll activate more muscle fibers. Yep. You'll utilize exercises more effectively. You'll get more out of your squat, more out of your deadlift, more out of your presses and your rotating movements. More strength, more longevity. More, and, and then, of course, the longevity aspect. But you have to sell that because, and it's true, because I know there's people who are like, eh, I don't hurt. I'm fine. Why would I spend? Why would I waste time doing? Well, we're just wired like. that way. We wait till it's broken. Right? <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. we wait. We want to wait until we can't. I mean, I was just having this conversation with my dad last night, who's getting to a place where you know his back is always hurting him, and I'm explaining to him chronic pain and why we need to address this and work on mobility and and prime your body. I'm telling him he needs to prime his body before he drives his car. Like you need to you need to learn what's going on at breaking down why your low back hurts because of what's going on in your hips and the surgery you had. You got to address that stuff. If you neglect it, eventually it's going to shut you down. Yep, yep. You may feel fine right now, and that's what a lot of the twenty year olds are thinking right now. And all I care about is getting shredded, you know, yeah. or building muscle. And so you're right, Sal. Like you have to sell it different because if it's something about longevity or being healthy or joint integrity, none of that stuff appealed to me at twenty five. No, it's funny. None of that stuff would have got. It's funny. Oh, yeah, I was just did sure. this. I just did this with my dad the other day. So my dad, he's got arthritis up and down his spine, a lot of his joints. He's, he's been working hard labor since he was a child um, and, and long hours and all that stuff. And he never really worked on mobility or stretching. He definitely played sports, but that was about it. And so he's very stiff, right? He's, he's prone to pain or whatever. And so I saw him the other day and he's like, my back, you know, it's so tight, so it hurts and my upper mid back, what do I do? And he's expecting me to go in there and massage him. And so I said, no, let's try this prone Cobra exercise. And he's like, how would an extra, why would me yeah. doing an exercise make that? Why does more work help? Yeah, yeah. that's not going to make it feel better. Why don't, and I said, no, trust me. So we did literally a few reps. I had him stand up. He moved around. And he's like, whoa, Salvatore, it feels so much better. Huh? What, what's going on? I'm trying to explain to him how the body, you know, the central nervous system works and all that. But that's literally uh, what, what it does. And it's more of a permanent fix. You know, if I massaged him, he'd feel a little better, but it wouldn't feel better for very long. Well, you got to mm -hmm. know that, so that, you know, back to like what I was talking to my dad about, very similar type of conversation. So they asked, so his actual specific question is, son, can you show me some back exercises I could do for my back? Because my back hurts. Mm. 
And then after asking a ton of questions and getting to the bottom of, oh, the hip surgery and the lack of good rehab, and I said, it's not your back. Mm-hmm. I said, it's your, it's your lack of stability and strength in your hips that your low back is overcompensating for that. Yeah. And it's not like a thing that happens right away. It's that because the body is unbelievable and resilient. Mm-hmm. So you may not prime very well and you go get a squat and you may see strength gains and you may not hurt yet. But what you don't realize is because your body is not working properly together, mm-hmm. that parts of it is overcompensating for the areas that should be working. Mm-hmm. And eventually that shit catches no, up. No, I dare anybody watching or listening to this. I dare you uh, go to uh, mapsprimewebinar.com. Double tr- dare. <laughs> try some of the priming movements on there before your workout, okay? And then I dare you to DM me and tell me that you're, you didn't notice a significant difference in how you felt immediately yeah. uh, in your workout. And I dare you to tell me you didn't have a Bo- better workout. Bring it. It'll, it'll blow your mind. Now, I want to add something to that, though, because um, one of the other things that was really challenging about you know doing this for the masses and video form was it's really hard to convey the intent, which is why we did these webinars. Yes, because because in this one, I, this is the one with Justin, right? Yeah, Justin does the Prime yeah. one. I do yeah. the Prime Pro. Yeah, Prime so Pro. this one's mapsprimewebinar.com, and he's taking Doug through, and it's good because you watch him coach Doug. He designed this test to address a lot of real common issues people face uh, because of their job. Maybe they're working at a desk, and they're leaning over all the time. Uh, their head is forward a lot. Um, and you're driving, pretty much everything in your daily activities involves you reaching something in front of you. And what this does, a lot of times, it's, it, it promotes this forward shoulder, this upper cross syndrome. And this test will go ahead and highlight how far that's gotten away from you. And so this is one of those things that don't worry Pretty much 99.9% of everybody fails this test because it's almost designed for you to fail just to show you how important it is to then reestablish this connection that will help your joints maintain long-term health and be able to work properly and, and do it without pain. And you get the idea. You know what the intent is, and it's it's much easier to understand. Yeah, you have to. So if, we, if we're trying to get connected to an area that's dormant or that we're not connected very well to, you, you ha- it's work. This isn't like stretching. This no, you're connecting, not this, disconnecting. Yeah, this is, doesn't feel like yoga. This doesn't feel like you relax and you stretch before you go work out. It's, I mean, if you do this right a lot of times, you'll start to sweat. You, mm-hmm. Your heartbeat will get going because you're trying to intensify that. You're trying to get connection and strength in this new round, range of motion. And so how you do it is so important. You can't just kind of like you're waffle through You're contracting the muscles. Yes. You, you know, this this whole time. And so, yeah, it is, it, it's it's work. It's real work. And you do sweat and, you know, the, it has to be active. And, and that's sort of the point to this is is we don't want to just get into these ranges of motion passively. We need to, to have that kind of tension all the way through. So we're training the body that, okay, we, we, we have access to, to this type of force and support uh, through all these different angles of the range of motion. Yeah. Now for most people, a good, once you figure out what you do for your body, you're going to spend about 10 minutes, uh, maybe 15 at the most, but probably around 10 priming your body before your full workout. Um, and that'll be enough to give you all the benefits that we just talked about for now, most people. Now I want to add something to that also, though. Okay, so yes, that's true. But what's beautiful about priming, because it's not like strength training, you're not tearing, breaking down, and you're not going right. to be really, really sore from doing this. And frequency is king here. So when you find a movement, so say you, you go through the, the webinar that Justin did for free and you, and you try a couple and you notice, like maybe you notice one or two of them, like, whoa. I did that, and when I went to do my bench press, I really felt a difference. My shoulders felt good. I was stronger. Do that all the time. It mm-hmm. don't, I mean, you definitely should and need to do it before you work out to maximize the benefits from your workout. Yeah, and do it on your off days. Yes. Mm-hmm. Do it all the time because it's a neurological thing. And the more often that you are practicing that, the more often you're teaching that pattern and that connection to get – solidified and strong so that when you go into that workout, you don't have to spend as much time priming. And this, and I tell you firsthand, when I started working on all this after Brink, I spent so much time in this area that I had to kind of let go of the like, you know, muscle guy and strength. It's just like, it was all going to be mobility and really getting reconnected to my body, right? And owning these ranges of motion. Now, what's cool is 
the more you practice it and you work at this, the less of it you actually have to do. Right. Because then you will start to do it by just not even you thinking about it. You connect much faster. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, you, think, you don't even have to think about it anymore. And it's it becomes easier when you put a lot of effort into frequently doing it. Yeah. In fact, they'll show with studies that connections in the brain, if they're practiced often, start to become uh, very solidified, almost like tracks in the snow. Like you have, right. it just snowed, so it's totally smooth. You walk through once, you leave some footprints, but if you walk back and forth, you create this nice line, this nice connection. And so you're you're hundred percent right, Adam. The more just like anything, right? Yeah. You practice it very often. Like it, it might have taken you years to learn how to play the piano. Uh, but then you could once you learn it, you could stop for a few years and then go pick it up uh, right yeah, away. Yeah, it, it makes its way into your subconscious at, at some point. And I think it just it takes uh, like I don't know how many specific number of reps, but it's a whole lot. I mean, there's been the ten thousand hour rule and there's all these people that, have, that mm. speculate on, you know how long it takes to actually acquire certain skills, but it definitely takes a lot of reps. Right. So again, it's mapsprimewebinar.com, totally free. Take the course and uh, notice the difference. Also, if you like this content, if you like our podcast, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. We have a lot of free guides and written content there, um, and you can get all of it for free. It costs nothing. It's a way that we like to give back to our community. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Doug at Mind Pump Doug. Literally, this is no joke. I know there's a lot of books written on the obesity epidemic and how to solve it, and they're like, oh, all these complicated. Literally, this is it right here. If people just reduce their heavily processed food intake down to about 10% of their diet, so 10% of your diet or less, heavily processed food, that's it. Eat like you want to. Enjoy your food. 